The Susan Brinder Show is a radio show online broadcasted on YouTube across the United States and globally. The show features guests who speak about health, spirituality, entertainment, and a host of subjects to enlighten people across the nation. Listen to the show that empowers women and men alike and highlights those who have made a difference. I'm Susan Brender, and here with my co-host, Sean Eugene Flynn, and you are listening to PTSD First Responders. Our guest today is Colonel Michael Brown, and Colonel Michael Brown is spending his retirement years traveling, writing a book, visiting friends and family, enjoying the outdoors, and has and will always dedicate his life to serving veterans and their families, which is a very important thing. He's volunteered as an intern with the Mission Continues Massachusetts General Hospital, the Boston Red Sox Foundation, and in Boston, Massachusetts, working with veterans and families dealing with PTSD and TBI. Colonel has been a hospice volunteer at the Department of Veteran Affair in Maryland. He's taken suicide hotline phone calls and numerous times was able to get help to distress veterans, and that is unbelievably important. Last but not least, Colonel Brown over the years has been a guest speaker at charity events in support of veterans' causes. I want Michael, if you will, to tell us your story. But before you do that, I want Sean Eugene Flynn to just take it all and go with it, Sean. Thank you, Susie. And uh, thank you, Mike, my dear friend, Michael Brown. Um, I'm going to get right into it, Mike. Okay, here's the scenario, Susie. It's a very important call right now. Okay, it's PTSD first responders. Susie, you're the dispatcher. You just did a great job. Okay, I'm the deputy. I'm Sergeant Flynn. We're going on an important service call to the United States of America right now. We are in what we call a field training environment. And Colonel Michael Brown is our field training officer. So, Mike, I'm going to cut right to the chase. We know that you and I, we operate from profound humility. First, because that's the ancient secret that our brothers and sisters who have gone before us that know is the key to victory. So with that in mind, Mike, what is going on in America today? Sean, that's a great question. You know, we hear so much right now with the current health scare in the world and here in the United States at home with uh, COVID-19. But I don't want the American uh, citizens here to forget about one epidemic that has constantly been going on since 2008. And that is the suicide rates that are going on with our veterans returning from war. So I, I would like to answer your question in under three different points so I can address that critical question, because I think you really need to have a scope of the problem, or should I say problems, because honestly, this is very puzzling and a complex topic we're talking about. Frankly, one we've been trying to solve since 2008, Sean. And even to be more frank, the nation has not moved this needle for the suicide rate in the veterans community, which today is 22 per day. That's one every 65 minutes. So that leads me to my first point. Sean, uh, point one, you know, the RAND study recently found that about 2.7 million service members have served in over 5 million deployments in combat theaters in Iraq and Afghanistan since 911. And 10% of those that served, alarming enough, three or more deployments. They have been exposed to three more deployments. And if you went to the special ops community, those numbers are up to 10 to 15 deployments. And so whatever the cost to the treasury of our truth toll of these wars and the human is a human one, there were more than 6,000 veteran suicides each year, each year from 2008 to 2019. So this is where you'll hear this number quite often, 20 or 22. This is the epidemic I'm talking about. So over the last 11 years, that's about 60, 6,000 deaths. That's 10 times the number that of people we have lost, soldiers, sons and daughters of this nation that we have lost on foreign battlefields. We're losing them more at home than we lost on those foreign grounds. So I know we've been talking about PTSD, but I want to talk about something else, something more, I think, overlooked, and that's moral injury. 
And that's what I want to talk on my next point. What is the root cause here? The needle hasn't moved over the last 11 years. I think we're talking about moral injury. That's what's going on in America right now. That's what's going on with our veterans. PTSD is a subset of moral injury, which I believe is the real underlying cause. It's a high stakes situation, Sean. Just like when you go out as a first responder, you never know what you're gonna get into. And that's what's going on out there in the war zone. The heat of battle, soldiers are often, often, too often, ordered to do something unspeakable in civil society. Just like sometimes you go out on your calls, regardless of their age, you know, they go out fire, fire on a village, it's what they're told to do. Regardless of maybe injuring non-combatants, going to buildings, blowing up trucks, convoys, bunkers, regardless of the loss of life that may occur. And these atrocities, they, they become deep, deeply seated memories that many veterans cannot shape from their minds. And you know what they do, Sean? They would go to, they go and suppress their thoughts and emotions. And they go to drugs, alcohol, and they isolate. That's how they treat their wounds, these invisible wounds we talk about, their moral injuries. So I think point three is after talking about that is the stigma of PTSD and moral injury and addiction. So we've sent them out. We've told them what to do. It breaks their moral code. They come back home back to their hometowns, they feel isolated, they're scared, they're angry, they got shame, they got guilt. They've done some atrocity because that's what their job told them to do. And now they got PTSD. Now they've been injured, just like any other folk who've been injured with a physical injury. Now they got a mental injury. Now they got moral injury. And now they're in an addiction to alcohol or drugs or some other substance. And we have to understand out there in America, we cannot dismiss these guys and gals as a place of hopelessness, but rather a place of growth. Somehow, we need to understand this when they come home. Right now, I'm not seeing it. Perhaps the most explosive, persistent myth about an addict with moral injury is that, you know, we're self-indulgent or that we lack some kind of moral discipline. You know, we know science has already shown that an addict has a chemical imbalance, a chronic disease, not a personal failing, as has been viewed by so many. For a military Mike, member. I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish that last point. Go right ahead. Yeah. For a military member who has served in America's wars, he's either witnessed, participated, or caused harm to others, even if indirectly has his moral identity ripped from their soul. It's shattering of the soul and bleeding of the spirit. And it's unrepairable wound at the time of impact. And if it's untreated, I will tell you something, it will kill you. I know for a fact it will. I lost a buddy. You and I lost a buddy. We remember Tommy back at uh, Warrior's Heart. He didn't make it. And there's 6,000 a year that are not making it. Hey, Mike, thank you again for bringing it home, the hard truth. And thank you again for also mentioning that stigma. You know, we take an oath, we go on, and when we come back, we're not the, the person that our families remembered. Uh, we change. We're basically not home, and it's, it's invisible. It's an invisible, it's like you said, like an amputation, and it stays with us forever. But you and I, we're battling this thing here, and we're doing it together in service. And my next question is, Mike, what should we be doing to address this epidemic because it's obviously that the medical field alone can't solve the crisis as we have lost 66,000 veterans since 2008 and the number keeps rising with no ending in sight. Yeah, this is that epidemic I'm talking about, you know, um, boy, that still hurts and it's haunting every time I hear that big, large number, 66,000 veterans and the way the number is going, Sean, as the apex has never be, been reached, it still is not reaching. There's no sight of it to be reached. It keeps on growing and growing and growing. Boy, it's a tough question. Um, but first and foremost, I, I believe, and, and I'm a very spiritual person. I'm not talking religious here, folks. I'm talking spiritual. And I've been in a big, large uh, medical facilities. You know, Susie mentioned that at first with the Mass General Hospital, Boston Red Sox home-based program. I've been involved with Veterans Affairs 
uh, for years now. I've been across the country and doing field research in, in local hospitals and local rehabilitation centers. I've been in peer groups. And what I'm not seeing is that a parochialism is going on. We have medical research going on. I don't see spirituality at all involved. And amongst our moral injury, amongst our war vets, you're going to see and discover a pattern of exposure and association to acts of violence. Think about this. This is what they see. Violence, killing, collateral damage. When I talk about collateral damage, their intended target may have been an enemy, but they end up killing women and children, not by purpose. They see rape on the battlefield. They see murder. They see torture. It has to be more than just a diagnosis of PTSD. So things that can be done, the more accurate diagnosis, I believe, is on the lines of more injury. Because the human part of this is associated with the act, and not to mention the death rate associated with injuries in this final stage. We talked about the 6,000 veteran suicides. Despite the last two decades, this is important. This is the hard truth. I love the way you put that. These are the hard truths. You don't hear it in the media anymore. I don't hear the president talking about it. I don't hear the service secretaries talking about it. I don't hear the veterans talking about it. Despite all the resources and the reform, no treatment to date has reduced the number of suicide deaths, fact, which means the diagnosis is off, fact, the treatment is off, fact, rehabilitation is off, fact, and at least that is true for 66,000 plus veterans who are now dead, right? Colonel, I'm going to step in for a moment. Sean, um, I want to uh, really understand a little bit more why uh, when you have this many deaths and people are aware of the travesty of what is going on, that the government and maybe other um, forms of help are not given uh, to the people with PTSD. Uh, it just doesn't sound right. But you know, and I know, and Sean knows, that there is so much going on out there with regard to PTSD, and yet it's not given the attention it deserves. So what do you attribute to that? I, I think that's a that's an excellent segue into my next uh, my next uh, address on this is how many of these patients these veterans have just been lost in the system. You know, there's a, a a program out of the state of Ohio. I had a meeting with the Ohio Supreme Court Justice Sharon Kennedy two months ago, and one of the uh, problems she has seen in the criminal court systems is that these veterans are being discharged off active duty and they return home, but the hometowns don't know about what's going on with them. They're given a short eight, maybe eight to 12 week session of transition from the army, but they come right back home and they get their Hollywood and they should get it reception for getting out of the military or coming back from a war. But after that, they're lost in the system. So maybe that's one way of, of, to look at it. The other one I want to look at real quick, Sean, is how many are dismissed in the treatment centers? I totally, in my field research, and Sean, I, you can tag into this too, because I know we've talked about this experience piece. We have a lack of certification and training in our treatment centers of the clinical care and how they actually treat the patients. Most of them are scared or lack the training to treat veterans who have, which I explained a little earlier, had acts and associations with those kind of horrible and insidious acts of violence on the battlefield. And most of the training, cognitive behavior therapy, high exposure therapy, most of them want to dismiss or forgive our mental traumas, but you can't do that. Or they want us to go through a six week, eight week session and then send us home and to believe it's okay. Third part of your question, where is the local Hallmark reception 
sustainment, counseling, ongoing care. Most places, it's not there. The state and the national have all these campaigns and strategies going on and all these events. What are we doing for the pandemic? The, the pandemic is going on right now. We are decentralizing all the way to the local level to help this with this. And we're not doing that today. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, Susie, if we have time, I have a question before we get to Mike telling us uh, about his book. Do we have time? Um, let me just say that we have a lot of extra time, so don't worry about anything. But I have to say something as well. And Sean, I, I have a feeling that you would agree with me with regard to this. Uh, Colonel, you know, people like to hear the stories that you're telling. There's no question about it because they're, they're absolutely horrendous and absolutely horrible. And they deserve the attention of people who have some way to kind of do something about it but what i would like to hear and i'm sure sean you feel the same way is like some solutions because people have to hear what they can do maybe they just don't know and they hear all these horrendous stories but on the other hand you are an expert and experts have the solutions and i i'm wondering if you could give us some of the solutions to the to the uh scenarios that you were discussing i think that's uh that's that's very fair and, and and it's a balance of ideals and cultures we're talking about here and, and as i stated earlier when, when i kicked off the first question this is a complex problem this is no doubt is going to take a national effort to solve but i think one one idea that i was kicking around was the difference must stop and we must have an openness uh, between the science community and the spiritual community because um, we're just tired of burying our national heroes. I think the spiritual and medical community can work together to actually start looking at things and start doing medical research and spiritual research at new ways of providing therapy uh, to our veterans. The second one is um, we look at our folks coming off active duty and do not release them without a reception and staging and onward integration back into their hometowns and in connection with their veterans community. Don't let that segue from active duty to a veteran status just be on the honor system. We're losing something there. Yes. So Mike, you know, I'd like our audience to hear from you. Okay. So for the families, a message to the families. Okay. Um, Mike, I miss my family. I miss my brothers and sisters in blue. I know now what I must do to survive. I'm doing it right here, right now with you, Mike. We're sharing and we're giving. We're giving back. We know what to do to right the wrongs that, you know, the suffering caused to those loved ones, those comrades on my right and on my left, those brothers in blue that I miss so dearly today. How can a message from you reach them if possible so that maybe we can all realize that we're not hopeless, we're not disposable, and shouldn't be treated like mercenaries. Basically, Mike, you know, I'm a first responder on the home front, right? So when I go in to raise my hand and I get sent to HR and I get to see a, a doctor, an outside contracting doctor, then I get sent home, it's a, I feel abandoned. So Mike, I think you're just talking about all these solutions right now, but what would you say in, in reference to what I just described there? Because you know, we're doing it right now and we're gonna keep doing it and we make no excuses. We're going to do what we can for the rest of our lives to continue to save others. But Mike, I'll let you bring that home. What do you think about that question I just asked you? I'll, 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 I'll tell you, Sean, and, and for those listening out there, uh, especially this is to the veterans community, uh, those on still on active duty and you're ready to come out, speak up. Don't let undue command influence while you're on the rolls call right now. If you are sick and suffering and you feel that you have, have PTSD or you feel a lot of guilt and shame and remorse for things you may have done or witnessed or observed while you were in combat, go to your medical facility. They have the final say, not your commander. Go get help because when you get on the outside, it's tough. It's tougher. Get all the services you can while you're still on active duty. Second, Contact your Veterans Administration before you get out. 
Third and foremost, join Wounded Warrior Project alumni before you get off the active duty rolls. This is the only program that I support right now that can actually touch the rural edge of America and provide something worthwhile. They have more resources and more connections around the United States, not just for yourself, but for your families and friends and support groups. I'm a proud member of that alumni. And it's for me, there's a lot of nonprofits out there, but your first one you need to connect to is the Wounded Warrior Program. And third, listen, this is very scary stuff. I've been dealing with my own PTSD and fears for the last four years. It's not easy. I'm telling you the hard truth. You can overcome it. You have two choices. The hard choice is trying to do it on your own. The easy choice is knowing you can't. Reach out. You need help. It's tough. And Mike, can you tell us about your book? Yeah. Uh, gosh, you know, one of my one of my toughest things I've ever tried to do is uh, write a book. <laughs> uh, but but a little about the book, and uh, this is kind of a uh, challenge for me but you know like anything in life you gotta you gotta always push yourself to do a little bit better and give back and this is what the book's about the book is called my fight in saint's hell it's a true story on moral injury you know when i first mustered the guts to write this book sean and Susie, um about moral injury i was sitting outside of a marriott hotel on the boston harbor here in massachusetts after recently hearing the news that my battle buddy Corey had just committed suicide in a hotel room right next to me yeah, Corey was a young sergeant from Fort Bragg uh, who had PTSD. Uh, him and I were both in an outpatient program for PTSD. And I was teamed up with him as he was teamed up with me. See, rank doesn't have privileges when you have PTSD. You're just battle buddies together, fighting it out. And the night before his death, I said goodbye to him after spending an entire day with him, learning about him. He was just the son of a great mother from Connecticut who served his tours in Afghanistan. You know, we went to art therapy, music therapy, did yoga together, had lunch with him. And that night I was supposed to meet up with him, but we never did. And the next morning I found out he had killed himself, overdosed. That's PTSD, Sean, Susie. It will take your life without notice. So I hope my book sheds light on the thoughts and emotions and behaviors of the darkness that plagues the morally sick and suffering veterans coming out of war in Afghanistan. That's what I hope. I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, yeah. but I think this is a very important point that we have to address. And that is that your stories are amazing. I mean, so sad and such a travesty. But on the other hand, people are very selfish you know, Colonel, they care about why is this pandemic 24-7 on the media? Because it could be them who get the disease. And that is something that they will really want to learn about, to understand what they could do about it, all these things. But when it comes to people like on PTSD who have you know, died for their country, or at least been wounded for their country. Do you think they care? Now, I would like you, and Sean, step in if you can, um, tell these people why they should be helping and why they should be caring and why they should be reaching out to their government and tell them what's going on. I want to know that. Susie, great question. And this is where we go back to our last show. We say to all the listeners out there, you know, as true first responders, as true, le true leaders, we know that we don't stand above or below. And what we try to do collectively is have compassion before comparisons, have profound humility before intellect gets in the way. Mike, I'm going to let you take this home. We're on this show here today as a result of the path that those that went before me gave me the courage to go do. I went back to my old agency. I was able to talk to my former boss. I was able to express gratitude. He put me in connection with the people here regarding this podcast because he's trying to make a difference. And I'm not here to, this is not a political campaign. I'm not a spokesperson for my former agency. This is the truth. You know, Mike, I'm going to let you bring that question home when it comes to compassion over comparisons and the need 
for profound humility because true warriors understand that victory comes in surrender. It comes in understanding. Mike, take it home. So, so often, I think our nation has a short memory, and that's a hard truth. What I'd like to do to answer that question is never forget 911, never forget World War II, never forget World War I, never forget the freedoms that we have on this nation rest on the sons and daughters who go out and fight the battle when called upon to lay their life down so that others can have the freedoms and liberties for this country. See, now is the time of need when they return that this nation needs to support them now and to find solutions so they can have their mental and spiritual well-beings back. This is not the time to run from a veteran. It's time to hug a veteran. We're still at war. You know, Mike, thank you. And again, to everybody listening, to the civilians, to the families, to everyone, that if we can surrender our egos, right, if we can open ourselves up to understanding that there's two sides to every coin. Okay. We're doing what we have to do. We've been through what we do. We've been through and we made a choice to do that. Correct. But on the other side, those that are listening, Susie, this ties into your question. Those that are listening that are having a hard time to relate, hard time to understand those that think, Oh, you just suck it up and move on. Listen, it's time to open up. It's time to work both sides of the coin we're going to work ours together as brothers and sisters as first responders but it's also time for those on the other end to start asking some questions to open up and stepping up their game mike i appreciate this Susie, i appreciate this we are doing what we're supposed to do today which is share okay and and we're sincerely grateful to everybody that's listening uh i'm sincerely grateful to everybody that's listening but i do understand that there's two sides to every coin and it's time that in america i believe from the bottom of my heart it's time that we all stop comparing ourselves and we all open up a little more so that the medical community and the spiritual community like you said mike the left and the right can keep going deeper and deeper so that we can bring these numbers down and that that's to the military that's to the first responders to the trauma nurses to the firemen to the medics that treat us when we come off, uh, you know, into the emergency rooms or from the battlefield, all of that suffering is real. And it's time that we all have compassion before comparisons. Again, I say that with passion and I'm just so grateful to be here with you, brother Mike, because I know that every day we have to check the box, work our equation and keep giving back. And that's what keeps us alive. Sean, um, I understand everything you said. It's passion that I hear in your voice. Um, but I, since we have time, I would like to ask the two of you, what about the families? You talked about them a little bit, but they suffer along with you, don't they? So I, I tell you, there is so much burden on the families. Why? They don't understand either. My mom, and I'll give you my mom's story, continuously wants her son back. Even to, even an email she sent me a couple days ago. Someday you'll be back the same Mike that you were when you left for the Army. Right now I don't see him, but I know he's in there somewhere. And one day I pray he'll be back. My wife is puzzled and I put her through so much pain and suffering because she thinks my identity has been taken away just because of the experience and I've had in the wars, my children. Sometimes when I came back, I was unrecognizable. I was angry. I isolated. I was shameful. I wasn't the same person. I wouldn't talk. I'd have outbursts. I would jump out of vehicles. And that is probably not uncommon with every other soldier or sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman out there. I just want to address yeah. this to Sean, if you don't mind. Sean, you were a first responder. You were a policeman. Did you have the same um, issues? Did you have the same uh, problems with your family, understanding who you were and what happened to you? 100%. And I want to compliment Mike on his courage. You know, I've, I come from a beautiful family. Uh, I had so much support 
And, you know, again, no one's perfect, right? So the truth is everything that Mike says, I can completely relate to. And what happens is, is in our suffering in that, as Mike describes it at the point of impact, it's an invisible injury. We then in our disease, unfortunately, become someone that really we're not truly are. And what happens is our family sees that it affects them. They don't understand. And I take responsibility. Um, it's painful. And now not only am I in this disease and I had this experience, now I'm living with the guilt and the shame of, of what I realized that happened to me. And I'm brokenhearted. Not only am I brokenhearted from my PTS and from my, my, my own personal problems, and not only do I hate myself and not want to live, you know, now I need to every day clean up the wreckage. And I think that's what we're doing now. Mike, I'm so proud of you because what we're doing here today and what we're going to continue to do in hopes that over the long run is that we can right those wrongs. But, you know, I, I wish I could get those on the other side to understand. But the only thing that I can really do about it today is exactly what Mike is doing today with me is to sincerely share and to be honest and that, hey, if, if those family members listen in and those on the other side listen open up and we can somehow meet in the middle and grow and heal together. Cause like I said earlier, I said, Mike, I miss my family. I miss the Palm Beach County Sheriff's office. I miss my brothers and sisters in blue. And I just have to be patient. I have to stay the course and continue to do the next right thing. But as Mike said, Susie, it's, it's uh it's where we need to all open up and understand that Mike talked about this invisible wounding, this invisible hemorrhaging. It's not make believe. I mean, it's a real thing that every day when we wake up, we have to do certain things to reset, get back into service so that we could be of service because it doesn't go away. In other words, Mike and I have been changed, just like Mike describes is when a, uh, an amputee loses an arm, we're not getting it back. So now we're not going to sit back and make excuses and be victims. And by the way, we don't operate from a victim standpoint. We're going to keep serving. We're going to keep helping other brothers and all that. And we're going to take the, you know, the uh, responsibility for our past successes. And we're going to take responsibility for our past failures. And, and, and we're doing that today. But I'm not going to lie, Susie. It's hard because I miss my family also. I miss my brothers and sisters also. Jump in if you would, Colonel, because Sean is um... – uh, he's so passionate and he's very emotional and I, I know that you are too, but I would love you to give our audience the last word because I know you have a lot to say. Boy, this is a powerful show. This, I would love to see, you know, and we love to see more of this type of show in our media. One thing I would like to add, and, and Sean really brought it home, is and you, and you wish we had spend more time with the family is my family could hardly sleep at night they had to deal with my nightmares my tremors my alcoholism my manipulation i was a totally changed man and at the end of the day i didn't want to live in 2000 15, I tried to take my life, and it's painful to remember that, that instead of trying to get help or see things for what they really were, I had enough, and I know what that feeling is, so if those folks that are listening on the airwaves right now, I've been to the ghostly feeling, I've been to the depths of this Satan's hell, and you, there's a lot better way out. And luckily, my family is the only one that took me from that depth and fought with me the whole way. And it may take time. There's two things you can remember. There's things, two things you can remember. It takes tolerance and patience, but you can make it. Sean and I are living examples of that. We've Mike, known each other you. for three years. Yeah. Well, this is a good time to close the show. And Sean, um, I want our audience to understand what is coming up next, because this show that we just did is so profound and so um, 
how is she, what would I say about that, Sean? I, besides the fact that it is so profound, what else would you say we we were able to accomplish? With, well, I tell you what, Susie. If someone out there is listening, uh, my email again is s f l y n n nine one seven nine at aol dot com. Let me step my game up. My phone number is five six one six four four five four five one and to take the high road with your question here, Susie, is that if someone out there is suffering, because that's really the primary purpose of what we're doing, reach out. I know Mike will obviously probably, I won't speak for him, leave his contact information. Email me, email Mike. And what you do when you do that, and I'm, I'm also going to talk to the agencies out there, even my former employers. If, if, if you're serious about trying to help guys, Okay, and, and, and I know they are, and that's why I'm on this show with you. I know they are, and they want to step up their game, and I'm going to step up my game. I'm here. I'm available. I'm not trying to force myself into any situation, but my, my, my primary focus right now is the men and the women on the front line and any suffering soul out there that needs to reach out. You reach out to us. You reach out to me. You're saving our life, and that's the truth. That is the absolute truth. My phone is on 24-7. Uh, you know, I'm not omnipotent. If I don't get back to you right away, give me some time. If when I do get back to you and I need to connect you with someone, if it's life threatening, of course, call 911, ask for help, go raise your hand first. But if anybody needs to talk, any family member needs to talk, anybody that has questions, you are saving my life. I won't speak for Mike. Mike, if you want to follow up on that. And I think the, the next show, Susie, what you're asking, I think we'd, it'd be a great idea to have Mike back for another show. And um, we can continue on this topic and continue to, to be of service just like we were today. Mike, you're a great uh, commander today. Susie, great dispatcher. You know, I'm just honored to be in the field uh, training uh, situation right now where I'm learning and healing and growing more. Uh, I look forward to more. And, uh, Mike, I'll let you end it. Yeah, great show. I uh, really appreciate you having me on today. Uh, one last uh, comment, and this is for our treatment teams that are out there. Our veterans are really in a knife fight. It's close and it's personal. Please have lots of empathy with them. Have a lot of compassion and listen to them and understand they are unique, beyond unique. Their experiences are unlike any other you've probably ever listened to. Please take good care of them. Their life depends on it. Let's get them out of trouble and put them right where they belong, back into society as heroes. Amen. Uh, how did they get in touch with you, uh, Mike? Please. Yeah, I can go ahead. So my, uh, you can get in touch with me. My name is uh, Colonel Michael Brown. Go by Mike. Uh, my uh, email is brown.mike734 at gmail.com. And my phone number is 256-783-9052. I'm always a, always a vet. Always will take care of vets and their families and their kids, whatever I need to do. Well, our guest today, Sean, has been Mike Brown, Colonel Mike Brown, who is an amazing man who's told the truth of a story that is so profound and so interesting. I am so pleased to have you on the show, Mike, and I'm looking forward to having you again. So thank you for being with us, and uh, we look forward to the next show. Thank you, Susie. Thank you.